Welcome back, Shaler area, to uh, chemistry. This is part three of the chemistry unit. This is the last part of the chemistry unit, so after the quiz on this section, uh, we will move on to the, the chemistry midterm exam. Um, all right, so, so far in this unit, we've talked about matter in as much as the atoms and molecules that make it up and how they're constantly moving. That was part one. Part two, we really looked at atoms and the periodic table. Uh, we learned why the periodic table is laid out the way that it is and how the individual parts of an atom make it what element that it is. Uh, you change one thing, you, you, know, you add one proton to an atom and suddenly you have a, a whole different material. And what we haven't talked about though is what happens when these atoms come together. And that's what part three is all about. So we're gonna we're gonna start learning today about compounds. So if you remember, atoms have a really tiny nucleus, and that's where almost all of its density is, is all of its mass is packed into this really tight space. Uh, but the atom itself is much bigger because it's surrounded by the electron cloud. And uh, in this model here, this is um, like a Bohr model. Uh, we have the little red dots that are the electrons. Uh, we have the nucleus that's in the middle. And when two atoms come together, I should draw another atom here. When two atoms come together, their nuclei don't ever come anywhere close to each other. So we get one more line here. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. So when two atoms come together to make a compound, the nuclei are really far apart from each other. So we have this one here and this one way over here. They don't ever come close. They stay really far apart. The parts of the two atoms that actually interact are these outermost electrons. Even the electrons in here won't ever come in contact with electrons over here. It's the outermost. Uh, if you can imagine, like two nearby cities that grow up and get bigger and bigger and start sprawling and bigger and bigger. It's going to be the outer suburbs that are bouncing up against each other. The inner parts of the city are never going to come in contact. Well, it's these outer electrons that determine the reactivity of an atom. Um, so while a element itself, it depends on how many protons it has, how that element interacts with other elements is entirely dependent on the outer electrons, and these have a special name. They are called valence electrons. So the electrons that are found in the outermost ring, the ones that are responsible for pretty much chemistry as we know it, are the valence electrons. Since these valence electrons are so important to understanding how elements interact with each other, there's a, a special way to write them. Uh, whenever you write an element symbol, you include the number of dots that it has equal to valence electrons. Well, how do you know how many valence electrons an element has? Well, this is what we've been learning about with the periodic table. You can find anything you want to know about an element in the periodic table. So here we go. We have across the bottom here a number of element symbols and their Lewis dot structures. So sodium has one valence electron. There's one electron in its outermost ring. It doesn't matter how many rings are, are inside that outermost ring. That outermost ring only has one electron in it. Magnesium has two. Aluminum has three. Silicon, four. Phosphorus, five. Sulfur, six. Chlorine, seven. And argon has eight. Notice they write it with two dots on each of the four sides of the element symbol. So Find these in the periodic table and see if you can figure out the pattern uh, that is held within. There's sodium, you should know where sodium is that We've talked about that. Oh, look, right next door is uh, magnesium. So that's these two. Aluminum's over here. Well, they all line up really nicely across the periodic table. A lot of you figured this out 
during the Element Builder gizmo. This was one of the questions in the Element Builder gizmo, and, and about half of you figured it out a long time ago, where as you move across the periodic table, you add one valence electron. What you're going to tie into that now is what happens as you move down a periodic table. So the first column has one, the second column has two, and then we kind of jump over these. These are those transition metals that we talked about. Um, you're going to learn later why, but we just kind of ignore those for now. We jump all the way over to this column, and suddenly we have three, and then four valence electrons, five, six, seven, and then when we get over here in the final column, we have eight. So using that pattern, write the Lewis dot structures for each of these elements. So find lithium. Lithium is found right there. It's in the first column, so it would have one valence electron. Carbon. If we skip these ones in the middle, carbon would be found in the fourth family. One, two, three, four. That means it has four valence electrons. Oxygen, way out over here. This is the sixth family. And then neon is in the eighth family, and it has eight valence electrons. So that is what their Lewis dot structures would look like. We use these when we match up different elements and figure out uh, how many bonds that they make with each other. You can use it to figure out what kinds of bonds that they make, um, but that's going to be what the next note video is about. All right, so you have figured out the pattern, the fact that as you move right across the periodic table, you add an extra valence electron. And then when you move down the next row, you start over again at one. So why is that? Well, it has to do with the structure of the electron cloud. Um, there's the different orbitals that, that Bohr suggested, uh, and as we, we now know that you know, it's more, more complicated than that, uh, it's easiest to illustrate what's happening using a Bohr model. Uh, we can talk about later what the electron cloud re really looks like, but you'll get into that more at the high school. Um, what we have learned is that there are these like shells and levels inside the electron cloud where you're more likely to find electrons. And the real secret to understanding the chemistry of chemistry is that atoms will do whatever they need to do to have a full outer shell. Uh, sometimes people will say that atoms like to have a full outer shell. Uh, it's, I don't want you to think that atoms are actually thinking and you know, going around and making decisions. It's not that they want or dis dislike things. Um, it's more that it's, it's the most stable form of energy or the, most, uh, the, the least amount of <clears throat> free energy that there is. So that's what they kind of settle into, almost like, like an uh, energy trough. So that's the structure that they're going to be in. When they have a full outer shell, that's when they are the most happy. Well, the first orbital is called the S orbital. Uh, it happens to be shaped like a sphere, even though that's, that's not why it's called the S orbital, but it happens to be in that shape. And S orbitals can hold two electrons. So here we have the nucleus. Uh, this picture is a much more accurately portrayed size of nucleus versus the actual atom itself. So we have a really tiny nucleus in the middle with all the mass. And then this is the S orbital. So you can imagine this being three dimensions. So it's a ball. And there are two electrons that are zooming around inside of there. And they're going so fast that they're almost everywhere at once and nowhere at once. Well, once you get two electrons in there, um, that's full. No more electrons can be crammed into that cloud. They're just going so fast that that's how much room that they need to take up. So there's another cloud. So it's another layer. So this, this one would fit inside this circled dotted line here. And now we have another, the 2s orbital. So the 1s orbital is inside, the 2s orbital is outside. They kind of, one is, you know, it's sort of like uh, one of those everlasting gobstoppers that, that changes flavors as you go inside. Uh, so they're nestled inside of each other. And out here we can fit two more, even though they're kind of all throughout. The inside fits two, the 2s orbital holds two more. And then if you go down the periodic table to the next level, you'd have the 3s orbital, and this would be the third shell. 
The second kind of orbital that we're going to talk about is called the P orbital. And P orbitals are shaped like peanuts. Although, as again, that's not why they're called the P orbital. Um, so they're shaped like peanuts, or figure eights, and there's three of them in 90 degree orientations to each other. Uh, so you really have to look at this in three dimensional space. So along the x axis, where you would find one, so there, there would be an electron that would be kind of zooming around in here, or actually two electrons that would be zooming around in there. One's going to be kind of over here, one's going to be kind of more over here, they're going to be jumping back and forth. Over here, you have it going like in and out of the screen, and then up and down, so in three different directions. These are the p orbitals, and each of these can also hold two electrons, just like the s orbitals. It's all going to come together here in a second. So as you count across the periodic table, when we had a full Lewis dot structure, it was found at the far right-hand side of the table. That's the noble gases. Those are the ones that don't react. Well, how many were there? There was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are the two S electrons and the six P electrons. When you have eight electrons in the outer shell like this, it's already happy. It doesn't react with anything. That's why the noble gases don't react with any, with any of the other uh, elements. They are really stable with the way that they are. There's no reason for them to interact at all because they have a full outer shell. If you would actually look at what an electron cloud would look like if we piece all this together, we would have a 1s orbital. So we have two electrons zooming around in there. Remember that nucleus is really tiny. This is probably even more accurately drawn. You can't even see it. It's so small. Um, and we can draw it with the Bohr model like this. So we have the nucleus, a ring with two electrons in it. It would look like that. The 2s orbital can hold two electrons. The 2p orbitals can each hold, each hold two electrons, so that's eight. That's why we have the second ring with eight. And then if you put it all together, it would look like this. You'd have the nucleus, you'd have your 1s inside, and then that would be this darker blue. And then the next shell of the uh, electron cloud would kind of be all of these together. So those would be the outermost electrons. And then if we drop down to the next row, the next period in the periodic table, we would then put a bigger S around this and then start adding bigger P's out there as well. So if we look at it with Bohr models, which is how we're going to draw them usually. We have hydrogen up here. It's in the first column, so it has one valence electron. So here is our 1s ring with one valence electron. We jump over to helium, <whistles> way over here. Well, that's odd. Why is it that helium is over here and not right next to it since it has two valence electrons? <laughs> Actually, some periodic tables do put helium over here which is interesting. Some periodic tables actually put it in both places. They have a helium in both spots because it has two valence electrons and they put it over here because um, it has a full outer shell. Remember that first s orbital can only hold two. So helium has a full outer shell with two. Every single other element has a full outer shell with eight. So we have one electron in the outer shell, and then we have a full outer shell all the way on the right. If we drop down here to period three, notice we're in the third period because hydrogen just moved off the screen. Lithium is in the second row. Sodium is in the third row. Well, look at how many rings we have around sodium. We're in the third period, so we have three rings. The first ring holds two, the second ring holds eight, and the third ring we're just starting has one. That's why sodium's in the first column. Magnesium's the same thing. You would count out, now there's two in the outer shell, and you go all the way across until you get to argon, which has a full outer shell. From this picture, I wonder if you can uh, get a little foreshadowing into what we're going to be doing when we're actually talking about 
these things coming together in the next note video. You know that sodium chloride makes salt. So here you have sodium, here you have chlorine. See if you can figure out why those two things love to come and interact with each other. Also, for the quick check, you guys are going to have to draw these four atoms. So when we do the quick check in class, I'll call on a random person to go up to the board and uh, draw the Bohr model of the atom. So be ready. So we talked about the S and the P orbitals. There are more. Uh, I don't want you to think that that's all that there is. Uh, we're not going to go on and talk about these other ones and how they actually affect chemistry. That's, that'll be more of the focus of the high school chemistry class. So you're learning the basics this year. When you get to high school chemistry, you'll start talking about this. Um, the, the rules are, are still the same. Uh, it's just the way that you apply them has to change when it gets more complicated like this. So down here you have the S orbital, uh, and then you have your three P orbitals. But then there's also a D orbital and an F orbital. And this is even outdated. They've discovered all kinds of different shells that get more complicated because of quantum um, thinking. So the D orbital, though, has, uh, has pretty neat shapes. Uh, it's got like this like ring with a, its own little peanut going through it. It's got a, like a crossing peanut situation going on. And then when you get to the F orbitals, you get like double rings. So uh, if you put them all together, this is what the elements in the F orbital all combined together would look like moving all the way down. So some of these do get more complicated. Have you figured out yet how this relates to the periodic table? Everything comes back to the periodic table. So here we have the S. These are the, uh, the elements that fill up their S orbitals. These ones don't have an outer p orbital at all. And then when we get the p orbitals, that's this chunk of elements. Those d orbitals with the funny shapes that I said we're not going to talk about how the chemistry works are these ones. And then the more, most complicated f orbitals are these elements. So everything falls very neatly in place with the periodic table. There is a reason that it is this shape. Uh, there's a reason that they fall so nicely in, in line with each other. Their chemistry has to do with how many electrons are in the outermost shell. And that's what the columns are telling you. The columns are telling you how many electrons are in. That's why sodium reacts very similarly to lithium. But as you move down the periodic table, you add shells. So those outer parts of the electron cloud are further and further and further away from the nucleus where all the positivity is. It, that's what's holding the electrons in, sort of like gravity in a solar system, but it's, it's electromagnetic charge. Um, as they get further out there, they kind of give themselves off easier uh, when they're interacting with, with other things. So that's why it gets more and more explosive as it went down there with the, with the, with the reacting with water anyway. And likewise, when you are moving up over here, you're getting closer and closer and closer to the nucleus. So that, that element really wants to fill that outer shell, and, and it's, a, it's a pretty big nucleus. It's really close by. And that's why fluorine is the most reactive element in the entire universe, because it really wants to get an electron in there. And it's these p orbitals that all are coming together. Anyway, that, bra that wraps us up. There are uh, 10 questions coming up. And um, in the next note video, we're actually going to talk about the different bonds and you're going to start to put elements together.